Welcome to our um, Open Access Week event, which is a joint event between uh, the Office of Scholarly Communication at Cambridge and Cambridge University Press. This is the second year in a row, in fact, we've run, we've run a, a joint uh, Open Access Week event, which is great. And, uh, it, it demonstrates the relationship that we have between the two organisations, which of course are one, because we're all part of the university. Um, now, just some housekeeping in relation to here. If you need to go to the loo, you need to go to the track past that door, across the lobby and up one flight of stairs to go. If there's a fire alarm and we need to get out, we can go out through this door here. If you need Wi-Fi, and you will because you are tweeting <laughs> during this event, the hashtag for the event is hashtag OAWeekCam. And if you want to tweet a question, you feel free. If you want to ask a question, feel free because you're actually in the room. Um, so the, you, there is information about the um, Wi-Fi for the building on the document that you have on your on your chair in relation to the guest Wi-Fi password. So, my name's Danny Kingsley. I head up the Office of Scholarly Communication here at the University, and we're very happy to welcome four esteemed uh, members of our community to talk to us today about this topic of, uh, is open access top-down? Uh, top, grassroots movement or top-down <laughs> position as demonstrated here. Okay, so I'm just going to um, introduce our panellists from the end. So at the far end we've got Dr Mark Patterson. He's the Executive Director of eLife and is a former Director of Publishing at PLOS. eLife is based here in Cambridge, so we're very lucky to have Mark available. Um, next to him we've got Matt Hodgkins, Hodgkinson, who's come across uh, to Cambridge Voice today. Um, he's the Head of Research in Integrity at Hindawi, which is an open access publisher. And he also is a former editor at PLOS One, he's been here, and Biomed Central. Um, we've got Dr Christy Whitaker, who's a Cambridge researcher in neuroscience, um, and she's a Mozilla Fellow for Science. She's an advocate for open science, and she's part of the team organising OpenCon CAM in 2015 so, and 2016, which will be on the 24th of November, by the way. Please come along. And lastly but not least is Stuart Lawson here. He's a researcher at Burbeck in the University of London. His PhD is in the politics of open access, so he's obviously very well uh, qualified to come and talk to us today and has lots of opinions, um, so <laughs> which you'll find out about. So the way we're working um, the, the, the program today is we do have some questions that have been sent through before, and so we'll be starting to work through those questions. Generally, one or two people will respond, so it'll be mixed up. Um, if there's something that comes out of that conversation and the conversation goes off into another direction, that's great. It's going to be fairly freeform and we'll be taking note of what's coming through on Twitter as well. So I'm just going to start with the, the first question which you are all going to, if you don't mind, answer in turn, um, which is, in one sentence, what does the phrase open access mean to you? Okay, um, it's applying principles of social justice to the way we distribute and share knowledge. So open access to me means that um, anyone can see the output of my work. Okay, I'm going to go with a version of one of the, they're called the BBB definitions of open access, which were defined about 2001 to 2003, Berlin, Bethesda, and Budapest. So it's free and immediate reading and reuse online of peer-reviewed literature with no barriers other than access to the internet. So that's also what I would have said. It's, a, it's, a, it's also it's immediate public access coupled with the rights to reuse, no barriers on reuse of the content. And so that latter point is usually enshrined with the, the CC by Creative Commons Attribution Licence to indicate that the rights of the author have been uh, gifted essentially to anyone who wants to reuse that content in any way they choose, so long as they attribute the original author so that they get credit for what they've done. Great, okay, so moving on. So this question is talking about the, addressing the actual topic of today, uh, about the, the dichotomy between grassroots open access or top-down imposition in relation to open access. So where do you think there might be greater academic freedom in those two? Do you want to start, Stuart? Sure. So academic freedom is a term that gets used to mean a lot of different things, really, but re it's really about the ability to say whatever you want within a research context and not lose your job or go to prison or whatever for it. It's not about writing, being able to choose exactly where you publish. You can't say, if I don't publish in Cambridge University <coughs> Press, my academic freedom has been uh, denied because uh, actually Cambridge University Press choose who they 
they go into publish. Um, so on, I'd say, where is the great academic freedom? At the grassroots level, in terms of individual freedom, it's at the grassroots level because that's an individual decision about what they're doing. If we're talking about collective freedom, what is the freedom that we all have together, um, then the top-down policies which might restrict an individual's decisions about what they're doing, they're actually creating a more free world. Do you, does that align with your position? Um, yeah, I, I think one, one, one of the thoughts that this question um, gave rise to me was, was the idea that, of, of this word imposition actually, um, and whether the kind of policies that we're talking about with respect to open access <coughs> Um, um, are they, you know, is it, is, it, is, it, is it reasonable to characterise them as an imposition? I think the way publishing currently works is an appalling imposition, actually, uh, in terms of what's required. Uh, so forget open access, just the way that the, the kind of rigmarole that you have to go through in order to get your work published, um, the kind of incentives that are associated with that, you have to often squeeze the content into a very small space and then delegate huge amounts of stuff into supplementary information. That's an imposition. The kind of tools that people are having to, to use, either as authors or reviewers or editors, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty clunky, as I'm sure many of you know. That's, that's an imposition too. So I think the way in which the system currently works is an imposition. Um, um, whereas, I would say in contrast, the, uh, the kind of policies that are leading to more open access behaviour are a, a completely rational and reasonable requirement um, from the people who, who, are, who are ultimately funding that work. So that's, 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 that's just, that, that, was, that was what that word uh, provoked in me anyway, in that sense. So speaking of funders, um, one of the questions we've had is relates to um, about open access and whether or not the original goals of the open access movement have actually been altered because of funder and government intervention. So if I think you, you, we have you down as a somebody who might want to yeah. talk about that or Matt. Yeah, okay. I can. Yeah, so I don't think the. I mean, the goals are still the same, and the goals are it's total and universal access to peer reviewed literature, and I don't think that any of the funder or government um, actions on this have changed. They have changed maybe how the goal is achieved. I think previously there has been, it was in the US you had things like the Harvard mandate which was set, set the agenda on that, you had things like the NIH public access mandate and this was very much looking at um, what people call green open, green open access where you um, deposit in a central repository or an institutional repository and then more recently you've got situations where um, the, the Finch report was much more favourable about, about journal publication, so gold open access as it's called, where the, um, the, the journal itself um, is publishing it open access under, commonly under a Creative Commons attribution licence. And so that will change the, some of the, the tactics in how the open access movement works, so it will change how you're you know, so librarians, it will change how they work. Do you persuade everybody to now remember to deposit in um, PubMed Central or equivalent repositories, or are you working with people to publish in open access journals? But the the movement has always worked with those two strands, and it simply just changes the emphasis on on those at different times. Um, so. Um, I I don't think they've been altered. So, so, the, so I think the funder and government intervention has been absolutely critical um, to, to, the, to, to, to helping to drive open access. Uh, so I don't think they've altered in any way the original open access goals, so I agree with that. Um, um, you know, I think without that intervention we wouldn't have got nearly as far as we are today. One specific example, you mentioned the NIH, there was, you know, there was very clear uh, change when the NIH, the original NIH policy was a was a was an encouragement, um, and then it got changed to a requirement, and the level of compliance, uh, you know, as you might expect, changed massively as a result of that requirement. So uh, there's an example where um, the, where the policy really helped to drive open access. Okay, so Chrissy, we haven't heard for you for a little while. Um, how would you convince an early career researcher, with which you probably classify yourself as one, to resist the attraction of journal impact factors and publishing fully open access journals? So I really like this question. It was the it was one that really sort of jumped out to me when I saw it. And my answer is one that I really, really dislike 
giving, but my answer is I wouldn't. The simple answer is that I don't think that this is a burden that early career researchers should have to bear. At the moment, when you are applying for jobs, when you're applying for grants, people do scan your CV and look for names of journals that they recognize and that they associate with prestigious work. And I don't think that that means that they are, that the work there is higher impact. I certainly don't think that it means that it's better work. I think, you know, um, Mark was talking about having to sort of cram everything in and then put all of your sort of best work in supplemental materials. I think that's, that is one of the problems, but it is the case at the moment that journal impact factors make a huge, they, they matter an awful lot. And um, so I would, I would not, I would not try and convince an early career researcher to do that. I would try to convince them to make, to do as much as they can to make their work openly available around that publication. Um, and I published in a, a sort of traditionally high impact journal this summer and you know we had some funding to make that uh, that article openly available so we paid the money for it and it the data and the code are all available and that's because I have control over that so there are certain things that I can make available and that I would strongly encourage um, the people who make the decisions basically what I want is people that are engaged in in this sort of discussion to be choosing whether or not I get a job um, or whether I get a, a tenured position or whether I get a large grant because those people I trust to um, read my work and and sort of um, just attribute appropriate amounts of merit to it but at the moment I don't think I would um, I would convince them not to yeah, yeah. yeah I think I mean some of what Kirsty says there is is true I think it would. It is a brave early career researcher who does publish all OA. Although, I mean, certainly, uh, Mike Eisen's lab for one of the founders of PLOS. I mean, his his lab publishes OA, and so and it hasn't harmed the careers of the people who've worked with him. So it, it certainly can be done. Um, there's also the point that you will publish in a diversity of venues, and so you may not publish your entire output in a fully open access journal, but you may find that you can um, go to hybrid journals, although they're maybe two to three times more expensive, um, but you can also um, self-archive as well. Um, but there are advantages to publishing open access. Um, many open access journals actually do publish high impact research. Um, uh, some of them have high impact factors. There are a lot of ills with the impact factor, but researchers are still driven by it. Um, but if you look at article level metrics, then certain um, articles are published, uh, cited very highly and um, used very highly. And so if you look at those alternative metrics, then you may be able to demonstrate the impact. There's also things like, as Mark was saying, there's no space restrictions, there aren't any hidden charges. People talk about open access being author pays. Actually, a large number of subscription journals also charge color figure charges, page fees, um, other things that people don't realize until your, you know, your paper's accepted and then suddenly the bill lands. Um, you can also do things like reuse figures without having to go begging to the publisher. Um, you can reuse them in your own research. So there's, there's a lot of advantages to publishing open access that it, it frees up the way that you can present your work. So for certain pieces of research, it actually might be kind of ideal that you don't want to cut it down. You do want to you know, be able to reuse those figures. And so I recommend looking at open access journals as an option for early career researchers, even if it's not the entirety of the output. So you mentioned Mike Eisen, um, who, for those who don't know, started up the um, Public Library of Science um, and is still very involved, obviously. He, though, has said that he's written, I think, I can't remember the statistic, it was something like he's written as many recommendations for people who've published with him and worked with him as he has papers, or, or there's some sort of correlation there. And I know that Rupert Gatti, who publishes, open book publishers here in Cambridge, has also said that they've given letters of sort of recommendation to explain what this thing is, this open book thing is. Yeah. So in terms of trying to encourage people to, to choose different options and ways of evaluating people, we, we still need to provide some sort of narrative to allow yeah. people to do that. Yeah, so from my point of view, I, I think publishing open access is absolutely wonderful, 
But until I am a PI on my own large grants, I do not have, I don't have control over those choices. And I can take a grassroots kind of approach and try and convince my, um, my boss, the various other um, investigators that I work with, but it is, it is an indirect route to me making those decisions. I think that's the challenge. So can I, can I just yeah. add, possible? So, uh, so I uh, completely agree with a lot of what you said, obviously. Um, I just want to reinforce the idea that there are lots of actions that you can take, uh, you know, early career researchers can take that, that are opportunities uh, to make their work more openly available. Uh, in the way, you know, preprints hasn't been mentioned. There's a, a growing interest in preprints in biology. There was a discussion meeting about that yesterday. Um, so I think you know it, it. It really makes sense to take advantage of those opportunities. And uh, so there was a really a, a fantastic article actually about the advantages to early career researchers, in particular, of open science approaches. You know, the, the self interest associated with that, which can help um, by Erin McKeonan and colleagues published recently. Um, uh, so I think all of those, uh, and the so and the other, but the other side of that is that there, we've sort of hinted at it, there is a desperate need uh, to reform the way scientists and science is judged, uh, the, way, the way scientists are judged and evaluated. And we need to get away from this focus on journal articles, more specifically journal names associated with work and the impact factors associated with those names. There is a huge amount, there is a huge call for reform. The, the, the difficulty is always how do you do it but I think there are there is real progress being made actually. So there are many policies now that are being uh, or policy statements that have been introduced, which emphasise the idea that research should be judged not on the basis of where it's published, but on the merits of the research itself. And and by the way, that doesn't just mean articles in journals; it also means data and other kinds of research outputs. And I do think there's real progress being made there. So uh, I think it's really important as well not to just fall into the trap constantly <coughs> saying the impact factor is the only thing that matters, that's the reality. The more you say it, the more real it is. So, you know, we have to, to some extent, you know, there the, the could be an emperor's new clothes a little bit at, at some point. You know, the impact factor maybe is diminishing in significance um, and we can see examples of that, real examples of people who've got jobs without emphasising impact factor. And stuff. So we need we need to also really to, to drive that to, to drive that idea. So speaking of um, journals, what do we think the relationship is between open access and journal subscriptions? Like, where, how, what's that that symbiotic symbiosis? Isn't really even a word? You know what I mean? Though, <laughs> how are they interrelated? <coughs> um, well, we're in a kind of a complex time at the moment because it's. A transition between uh, a fully subscription system and what uh, trying to make a fully open access system, um, but there is the end isn't really in sight yet. We're in the transition. We're going to be in one for a long time. If this even is a transition, maybe we're just stuck in this kind of in between space. And in terms of the economics of that at the moment, it's still the case that. Something about 85% of the total amount that is spent on um, publication in at the moment in, in the UK, which is so about 85 90% is still spent on journal subscriptions, and that's in the UK, which spends a lot more money on open access than some other places do. Um, and that's changing but very slowly, and of course, most of then most of the money that's being paid for open access is still being paid to the same four big publishers anyway. Um, so the fact that um, hybrid open access and um, hybrid journal, so there are traditional subscription journals where you can pay for an individual article to be made open access. Um, there's a lot of problems to do with that now because that's where most of the money is going. <coughs> so what we've been talking about so far, um, is sort of around sort of how open access has been sort of developing and where we're up to and convincing people. And so we are trying to talk today about whether this is a, a grassroots or a, a, a top-down imposition. So sort of thinking of that, um, in relation to the imposition side of things, a lot of the discourse in open access comes from the science background. 
because it's about publishing in journals and a lot of the work's happening in journals. Now, this is an imposition of technically on humanities because humanities operate differently. So, uh, do we have incentives for humanities researchers? Is it a different scenario? I think it probably both. Um, Matt and Stuart might have opinions on this. Well, I mean, I'm, I haven't worked in the humanities and like the publishers I, I, I have worked for have not been in humanities journals, but I have certainly seen that some of the opposition now to some of the open access policies has been the loudest voices seem to come from, like, there's, there was a group of historians in the UK, there's recently been um, a humanities professor in, in Germany who was outraged at the, um, the, the German policy. The German policy was simply that you should have your work open access either in an open access journal or in an in, in institutional repository if that wasn't the choice. And this was attacked as the, the what um, Stuart was talking about, academic freedom, imposing on academic freedom and um, uh, kind of totalitarian policies. And so some of the, the, the rhetoric that happens um, is really overblown and I think it's it's a lot because people feel that the, the journals that they publish in might be under threat, although that often isn't the case. The increasing number of journals have been flipped over. It's happened in high energy, high energy physics, it's happening in, um, uh, in the humanities. Um, my publisher in Darwin reached agreement with Wiley and nine of their journals flipped to open access earlier this year and we, we now publish them. So um, I think there's much more of a, a feeling of threat in the humanities towards open access. And some of it may be because the, the model of, um, of funding, which was um, come up with um, about 15 years ago of the article processing charge, it doesn't necessarily map very well to the humanities. Um, you can try with very low article processing charges, but then there's only so low you can go before you um, can't, can't cover the costs. And so you are getting other funding models coming in in open access that can can address that. You can get a um, library consortia. Um, you can have uh, funding bodies and other institutions fund it. So um, there, there's various kind of mixed models that, that can work there that may help with the human with the humanities. But I don't think it's um yeah I don't think it's such a such a huge threat. But I can understand why. And it's also there's much more publishing in the humanities that occurs outside research articles. In the sciences, this is the real key. Whereas um, there's also book publishing and monographs, which actually that discussion hasn't been had as much, um, and it is it is less clear how it can be moved to in a way that that makes sense for the researchers and for the publishers. And so there's a lot a lot more discussion needs to be done about how those those work, both for ideas of um, what should be made free and how that could be funded. So this ties into, Stuart, um, another question, which was um, what is the most important development in the past year in open access? And you had an answer which I think ties right into that yeah. conversation. So it's the same. So we talk about um, the Open Library of Humanities, which is a publisher that was um, it launched about, about a year ago. And there what they're trying to do is a kind of plus style publisher, but for the humanities, so there are some differences. And the key difference, difference is really in funding and governance. So um, uh, OLH, Open Line Humanities, they publish um, individual journals and a mega journal, a plus one style uh, mega journal that covers the whole of the humanities. There are no APCs, there are no fees for authors, for, for anyone to, to uh, to pay because it's collectively funded. So their kind of the insight there in terms of funding is, if you want to th make, if you have a thousand institutions paying a publisher a thousand pounds each uh, in order to get access to some research, if those thousand institutions continue uh, agree to continue to pay the same amount of money to the publisher, but they don't worry about the, the fact that they're, they're special and they're the people that are getting their research. They'll continue to pay the money but allow it to be open access so everyone can uh, read it. And that's, that's uh, kind of how it works. And they also get a stake in the governance and they get a say in which journals come on, come on board onto the system. Um, so there are 
and this kind of uh, flipping of uh, closed access journals to open access journals can be um, quite useful because uh, it could be a journal which is very highly regarded in its niche field um, and obviously in the humanities impact factor is, is irrelevant but the prestige of particular journals in particular fields is still a similar kind of thing. And if that comes on board and becomes open access in this shared collective funding model, it means that for the author, they don't need to do anything. They don't need to suddenly be converted that open access is a good thing. They're just continuing to send their research to the same journal that has always been the best one, but that journal happens to now be open access. So you're talking about the institution supporting something like that. And when we, when we talk about that, we're really talking about the library. Yes. So, um, <laughs> So, Chrissy, given their access to the research community, do you have an opinion about the role librarians can play in, in promoting open access or how, so, the role they play in the whole ecosystem? So, Danny mentioned at the beginning that I um, have helped to organise the OpenCon uh, Cambridge uh, satellite events uh, last year and then this one that's coming up 24th of November. And, um, OpenCon is a conference for early career researchers focused around open access, open data, and open education. I have to say that I, my personal interest in OpenCon from the beginning was open data. That's my little sort of, that's the thing that I care an awful lot about. But through organizing OpenCon Cambridge, I have met librarians and, and um, I think probably and I know librarians know this, but I don't think they've quite achieved the goal. Um, I think educating researchers, particularly uh, postdocs, such as what I am, or PhD students, about what the library actually does. I think we still, I still, and I'm trying to get over this, think that librarians check out books for six weeks and stamp a little thing at the beginning and then scan them when they come back. And I know that that is not true, but when I think about the university library, I think, well, I've no, I've no, I've no need to go there. However, when I successfully access many, many articles when I'm at my desk and unsuccessfully access those articles when I'm working from home, now, I'm suddenly a lot more interested in what the library has to do for me. So I, I think um, just reaching out and, and making sure that the, um, the researchers... So just linking back to my previous answer, it's a, in, if you're a postdoc or a PhD student in science, let's go with what I know, your PI, your thesis supervisor or your, your postdoc boss is basically God in your world, right? That person will write your letter of recommendation. They will be the last author on your papers. They will guide what you do. And it is therefore not uh, sort of all, to the early career researchers' interest to go and find out what the library does. And I think if librarians can effectively reach out and communicate really well with the um, PhD students, the early career researchers across the board, they'll find a a lot of allies who are sort of will join them in the outrage at how much they pay and various other sort of um, situations that we have at the moment. And they will also going back to to Mark's point, the researchers will find these amazing allies that they didn't know existed within the university structure. Um, so that would be just sort of making making friends and 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 really sort of clearly explaining what <clears throat> in the twenty first century a librarian at a university does. And and it can go. Much, I think it can go a lot further than just urban access uh, stuff as well. And I'm sure it does. You know, to to take uh, to to alert people to important uh, things like orchid. Which is you know your your unique ID as a researcher. Not everyone has an orchid yet, but they should because it's a really important piece of infrastructure, which then allows you as a researcher to be unequivocally linked to a set of research outputs. So that's articles, but also lots of other outputs that we've we've talked about. So I think that. And then there are other resources like uh, Publons, which is uh, maybe less uh, less well known certainly than Orchid, but Publons is an effort 
to, um, to surface the contributions that people make in peer review. And that would be a wonderful thing to do because it's an incredibly important scholarly activity um, and it's largely done uh, inside a black box that most people don't know about and people don't get credit for it. And as any, any all of us I'm sure probably know, um, pe some people are just brilliant at it. Um, they are conscientious and thorough and constructive, etc. And other people are much less so. And it would be great for the people who do a really good job to get uh, maybe a bit more credit for it. So, uh, you know, and so I think like, I would imagine that the library is the locus for a huge amount of this information. Um, and so that could really help uh, with the sort of whole information ecosystem, uh, sort of educating about that. Because it's all beginning to be connected together and that will help to solve some of these problems, I think. People often also think of, as well as kind of stamping in and out books, then people often think of um, libraries as just being about managing general subscriptions. And actually, there's a whole side of what libraries do of working with open access publishers to reach institutional membership agreements. So there's this idea that kind of author pays is what the article processing charge means. And actually, it's mostly funders and libraries who manage that, that payment method. So it will be, certainly in some cases, some individual authors will be, um, will be finding payment. But in, in the broad part, it's librarians who've reached institutional membership agreements. Um, and then the publishers can then work with the library and the researchers to make sure that certain of the um, requirements and the mandates, like getting your articles into uh, central repositories and institutional repositories, the librarian will work with the publishers to make sure that those things happen smoothly so that the researchers don't actually have to worry about that. So that's a, definitely a side of things that librarians do that I think many people don't, don't quite realise that they're actually doing a lot of work in that area. So I think there are probably some some library staff in the room. Well, I know that certainly other people who I'm working here in the room who we work in libraries. But um, I'm just conscious that we've been talking for about half an hour, and so far we've not um, had any commentary from the floor. Please do feel that if you want to contribute or say something, you're welcome to do so. What what we will do, by the way, if you do do that, is I'll repeat it. So hopefully it'll go into the microphone. So um, has anybody got any comments so far, or are you all feeling too shy? Yeah. I've got a question. Uh, my name is Paul Simpson. I, uh, I'm the deputy editor at Post Medicine. So I was looking at this sort of top down imposition and I wondered whether, beyond um, saying that it's a requirement, whether the funders, uh, you know, what's the role of the funders in making it happen? So imposition sounds like there should be some kind of policing, so a stick as well as a carrot. And I wonder whether that, I, I'm just curious if, if there's any comments about that. So, the, so the, your question is, if funders are, are requiring people to do this, what is their, is their obligation beyond providing money? Yeah, but the, so it's not uncommon, for example, to see uh, uh, studies funded by uh, big funders with, with a policy, um, but they're still trapped behind the subscription barrier and you, you would need to pay an article processing fee. So then there's this kind of question of, uh, are they really imposing <laughs> anything or are they just encouraging people to publish so so do you guys anybody yeah yeah so uh, so now i think i think i think i think it's a really important point uh, that um you know you, so you mentioned sticks and carrots so yeah i think i think uh funders and institutions can do both sticks are helpful in some circumstances you know uh, welcome for example have got a bit tougher in terms of if you don't comply with the policy they will withhold the last ten percent of the grant, or whatever, and and there's a, there's a consequence for the next grant that you write for if you don't adhere to the policy. Uh, there are certainly sticks operating in terms of the way publishers are are complying with their welcome policy. So those things are helpful, in a sense. Um, um, maybe not so attractive. Carrots are better, I think, in a way. I mean, so so, but again, funders can help with that. They can help to change the incentive system. That we keep talking about, but I do think it's incredibly important. Uh, so welcome, for example, have an allied statement about people being judged on the basis of the merits of their work, not on the basis of the journal in which it's published. So, and there are many more examples of that uh, kind, of policy, uh, kind of policy statement. But then, then I think you're maybe touching on something else, which is carrots and sticks aren't enough. So to sort of extend the horse and cart <laughs> analogy, what you also need is a really smooth road with no boulders or potholes in it. And you need the cart to have frictionless round wheels, ideally, <laughs> uh, and stuff like that. So you, you need, in other words, the infrastructure that will make this not maybe even easy, but enjoyable. 
so, uh, so you know, so it goes back to things like um, the tools that uh, authors have to use, the process that they have to go through in order to submit their work. I think it's up to us, open access publishers, actually, to sh to, to to really compete in that area and to show <laughs> how you know publishing in eLife or in, in Darwi Journal or Plus or whatever is just fabulous. <coughs> Why would you go anywhere else? Because the tools are gorgeous, you can tell your story uh, in exactly the way you want, the process is, is great. So we have to be you know, brilliant publishers, so that's us. The funders though uh, can do things well that like they have done, things like PubMed Central. You know, a wonderful piece of infrastructure which is demonstrating, uh, you know, in, 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 in my <coughs> view, one of the best demonstrations of the power of open content. You put all this open content in one environment um, and then you can add value to it. You don't have to ask anyone's permission, you can just do it and, and you can make it more discoverable and you can link it with data and you can provide all sorts of interesting metrics around it and, and on it goes. And that's what open access, you know, that's kind of what open access is all about. It, it's that sort of vision of just making the literature much more powerful. So, uh, so sticks and carrots and infrastructure are, are, are all things that come from potentially the top down. Certainly when we call them the new position, you know, I would call them just, you know, being sensible, you know, providing the things that people need in order uh, to make their work more open. So, um, you have a flag of absolutely. Can I just say it's on, on, on um, your point? I would, I, I think things like the Welcome Trust holding back 10% of the, of the grant if you don't comply is brilliant. So, as someone, so I'm an early career researcher. I am convinced by the moral argument. I'm also convinced by the fact I think people should be able to find my work and they should be able to cite it and share it and use it and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I can do quite a lot of work or, or choose, make my choices to publish in different journals and there are no consequences, even though people have got funding that says that it's supposed to be made available, drives me crazy bananas. So I think, I think there should be. A, I think I really think the last, the, you know, the last amount of money should be withheld until you've until you've shown compliance. And I would be interested to know who would argue against that as an imposition, because I think that's just sign, that's just following through with what you said you were going to do when you got the money from the funders. That would be my point of view. I'm just thinking about your analogy. I was something. listening to something about driverless cars on the radio, and they were talking about the, you know, the, what's been before, and everyone thinking the world's going to end. And they were, when horses were, were being replaced by cars, this was a terrible thing, and we'd only see horses in zoos. Um, and that, that actually the reality of horses was terrible because they die and then nobody leave, nobody moves them. They'd just be this dead, rotting carcass on the side of the road. So when you run that analogy, <laughs> <laughs> that sure what that does with it. Um, Speaking of disaster, um, oh, it depends on your position, but um, one of the questions has come through about Brexit. So, and whether or not Brexit is going to have any sort of impact on um, UK research funders and institutions in relation to open access. Do we have any comments or opinions on that? Well, it, it's going to mean that the funders have less money to go around and open access. Um, might be one of the things that they cut back on. Any other? Yeah. Well, we don't know yet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But um, certainly, currency fluctuations are going to be affecting things. Um, it's going to be affecting funders. It's going to be affecting publishers. So it does. It makes things more difficult. Um, I, exactly how it will affect things, we we'll yet to see. It will. I mean, it will presumably affect things mostly in the UK. To say, right? Yes. And so, so well, most publishers are, you know, international, and so uh, in that sense, um, you know, we are, we we will not be affected. Uh, you know, the, the effects of what's happening in the UK will be mitigated to some extent by by the fact that there's just a lot more stuff that we're publishing from elsewhere. But you know, certainly, I think the uh, the more worrying concerns are about the impact on research itself. You know the, the, the way that research is funded, the way the, the, whether there will be impact on the views of Europeans wanting or thinking about coming to work in the UK. Um, I think it's unclear, but the, 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 there are certainly people expressing concerns about what you know how that will change um, the UK's ability uh, in terms of collaborations and funding 
within the European context. So I think those are real fears. Also. One, uh, one thing about the currency fluctuations, obviously the um, journal subscriptions, um, which often now include an open access element in them, these offsetting agreements, yeah. um, it's suddenly become kind of the top issue for the, journal, for the uh, negotiations with the publishers in terms of getting a good deal, because suddenly um, if you're paying in euros or in dollars, which a lot of the, a lot of the subscriptions are, um, it's just gone up by twenty percent. You can't afford that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. so it really comes down to money. Is the sort of I think <laughs> I, I would say the biggest <laughs> issue is more around the people, be it whether they're able to work in the UK or, or or vice versa. I think that's the biggest that's the biggest sort of challenge that's faced in terms of publishing open access. Probably financial. Yeah, I, you know I get. Um, I get paid in US dollars at the moment and I am filthy rich. <laughs> it is, it is yeah. unreal how much my stipend has gone up since the beginning of the, the, beginning of the summer. So um, I think that will be, in terms of open access, I, I completely agree with the point about I think it's going to be the currency fluctuations that's most uncertain. Okay, so let's, let's for a moment take the position that the open access agenda has been co-opted by, by top-down imposition. And if we were to say, down with top-down imposition and get rid of it tomorrow, who would be best placed globally to sort of lead and provide the infrastructure, resources and communication necessary to support this grassroots vision of open access <coughs> utopia? Do you have a opinion, Stuart? Yeah, no one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the things have to be paid for, and there is not suddenly going to become this money is not going to appear from anywhere else. I think you answered the you you gave an answer to this question earlier on, which is the open library of the humanities. Yeah. You know, so I think that is a, a you know a model uh, that is interesting, very interesting. It's designed for the arts and humanities community, but one of the things that I find intriguing about it, as well as, is, is could it. Could it extend? Actually, could it be the, you know, yeah, could it help library. us in science, right? You know, we've sort of got this publication fee model, which is, uh, you know, which is developed, like you said, about 15 years ago or something, and it's, it's blossomed since then and has been, uh, is being used very effectively by the by the by the, the large conventional publishers now. They are now the biggest open access publishers and and doing very well. Thank you. Out of it. Um, so, um, and I think there are real questions, therefore, about whether you know that's the future or whether this is just yet another transitional stage. So, I don't think that the AP. I'm not even sure we have an APC model anymore, in a sense, because it, it, you know it's it's a, it's a lump sum being paid to a publisher. But that's not an APC, um, so it's a big deal. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm deeply um, sort of uh, concerned, I suppose, about the future of that model in terms of its ability to generate an effective market uh, for scholarly communication. And I think what the OLH do is very interesting. So but I'm going totally off topic a bit with, in terms of you know, who's, in, who's best placed to provide the sort of infrastructure and so on. There is one other example. Uh, so I think OLH is very interesting. There's one other example which hasn't come up, which is, um, which is in Latin America. Uh, so it's Cielo. Uh, so Cielo um, is an organization, it's centrally funded, government funded organization, which has provided the infrastructure that supports uh, open access publishing by hundreds and hundreds of journals in Latin America. And Cielo is maybe 50 to 20 years old, something like that. And they, they launched at a time when, as, as I understand it, there were a bunch of somewhat ailing print journals um, and they wanted to save these journals and they wanted to raise the standards of these regional and national journals. And so, and obviously they were aware of this print to digital transformation transition that was taking place. And so Cielo was born as the solution to that. And so they moved all of these journals into a digital environment. At the same time, they made that digital environment an open access environment. So they didn't go through this messy transition that we're trying to negotiate of print to digital subscription, from digital subscription to digital OA, which is really, you know, hard and messy. They went just all the way in one go. Um, and, and, um, and furthermore, uh, when they went through that transition, 
they also they uh, they made they came up with criteria for entry. So the journals had to achieve a certain standard in terms of their peer review process and so on, in order to be included in this uh, CLA platform. So and and then that's just propagated. It started in Brazil and it propagated throughout Latin America and uh, and elsewhere actually. Uh, now, so I think that's another really interesting example of uh, the benefits of uh, you know centralised infrastructure and how that can support um, a, you know a, an open scholarly communication system where people you know there's no, there's no man but there are some mandates um, but mostly I think it's just that well it's the same journals you know the same regional national journals they just have to be open access now so as a researcher there. Um, you know, uh, my behaviour doesn't really need to change in, in that sense. So I, I think it's a fantastic example which, which isn't talked about enough and um, there may well be lessons for us. I wanted to slightly challenge the premise of the, um, the question because I think we have to remember that the rise of open access has been very much driven by grassroots roots movements and they have in different ways as Mark suggested, they've come through different routes so there have been grassroots movements that in some of the same movements have had different effects and so you had the um, the original PLOS uh, petition from 2000 which thousands of people signed and they wanted Cell to drop its subscription barriers well it didn't happen and so PLOS had to put their money where their mouth was and so those grassroots scientists came together and formed a publisher and so you have you have grassroots movements have founded open access journals so you had the open journal systems was created and that's had a flourishing of open access journals there um, on, on the other hand, then you had people lobbying to get um, uh, what eventually became PubMed Central. So that was grassroots scientists, uh, some of them who happened to be Nobel Prize winners, it helps. <laughs> but you then, so, you, and so then the government goes, okay, great, we understand the arguments, we're going to fund this. And so, but that has come about by researchers and um, patient groups lobbying. It hasn't just happened by itself. It hasn't been that suddenly the, the governments, the funders have woken up and gone, oh, suddenly we'll have to do open access. This has happened after two decades of hard fighting and people building things up themselves. And so now you've got, fortunately, you've got groups like OASPA, you've got publisher groups like Crossref who help bring together the infrastructure. And I think, you know, Mark's right, that's, that's where we need to be going is get better infrastructure working together to facilitate things. So we don't just have PubMed Central. You know, recently um, NASA work is now going to be on a part of PubMed Central. And I think that kind of step so that you've got more interdisciplinarity, you've got more of the institutional repositories can work better together, be discoverable. That's where the open access movement needs to go. And that's helped by funders and government, but that's not an imposition on the movement. That the movement has driven it and got us here. So, is it the case that something like this, which is an international and very complex ecosystem, can only go so far under grassroots steam, and that at some point it's not going to go any further until there is that, because we are talking about serious infrastructure, that that can't be built on a grassroots level, that it has to be built from the top down? I mean, have we hit that point where that's the only way forward? Um, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to ask, is it not a success of a grassroots movement to get large institutions mm -hmm. to sort of follow along? I, I feel like the, the, I completely agree with everything that you were saying and it, I was nodding along because it just sounded like <laughs> the people who had the idea, who made it happen, have, have managed to convince the big names and, um, and and the funders and the policy makers and everything else like that and so I I'm I, I feel like by definition a grassroots movement should only be going so far it, that's my personal and maybe I'm I'm on my own here but my personal definition of a grassroots movement is to get is the advocacy to get it started and then, you know, allow it to, to blossom and become um, a big bureaucratic, you know, <laughs> behemoth as all of our other aspects. But, but that, to me, is a, is a success of a lot of the different um, open access advocacy that's happened. I don't, I don't see it as... I'm not quite, I think, in terms of challenging the question, I'm not quite sure what it means by being co-opted because many of the agendas are actually falling in line with what the grassroots wants. 
Maybe, and you answered this question earlier, maybe not in exactly the same way, maybe the path is slightly different when big institutions do them, but it seems like the, the co-opting is, is a positive step. Do active people in the, are in the room have an opinion on this? Yeah? Um, so I, I, I think there's been some really interesting points here, and I guess one of my observations of moving to the question very quickly is that grassroots, you know, you can have a competition, different grassroots and movements, and there's a healthy kind of, you know, balance and competition of different ideas. And then when the top-down approach comes in, it can be very powerful. But I wonder if the panel would agree with me that I think the top-down approach is actually very, it is, it's like, coming back to an analogy, that it's kind of going in both directions. You've got gold and green, and they are, they are truly going in opposite directions. And I wonder if that lack of direction from the top is actually holding everything back. Um, and that, that, that so, so I wonder whether you agree with me that, that, that fund of supporting green and gold together is actually becoming a, a barrier to progress. I would disagree with that. So I, to me, gold and green open access are, com are complementary um, things. Um, like as you were, as you were talking before about early career researchers, some people just really feel like right now they're not in a position to be taking risks themselves with the way they publish because their uh, their wages depend on it. Um, we do need to. All of this is really all the problems we're talking about are really labour problems. It's about the organisation of labour and the, the problems with that, and that's where it all stems from. Um, but in that instance, green open access and using repositories is a really good thing. Um, and so, UK is an example that uh, Hef, Hefke and Darcy UK, the two big researchers, one having a gold policy, one having a green policy. It makes it really complex for institutions administrating all this, um, <laughs> for, for librarians, um, and it makes it a complex as because researchers need to think about which policy are you complying with right now, there are differences, but I, I still think it's worth it in terms of the extra amount of access that you wanted by having these um, kind of different routes to that. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that. I don't see them. I don't see them as diametrically opposed. Um, um, I'm curious as to why 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 you see that. I mean, I can, I can kind of see that, but um, it would, what would be good, I think, is given that I suppose the more greenish policies, um, you know, like the NIH policy, it would be, it would be good to see these things evolving. Actually, I suppose I always imagined that they, you know, they're certainly certainly not incompatible with gold, right? If you if you if you take a gold open access publishing route, then you will comply with the <coughs> policy. You're just going further than the policy demands, which is fine if you've got the money to do it. Um, um, so I suppose I saw them as a sort of a step towards, you know, ultimately a fully open access uh, literature. Um, um, but. Um, uh, has that hasn't really happened? I mean, in the sense that the you know, so why hasn't the NIH said, okay, we're going to make it six months now? Uh, why didn't it do that? It could have done that several years ago, and then and then said, okay, we're going to have a gold policy now. You know, we're going to make that the norm. We're not going to say, you know, maybe like the welcome, you can still you can still comply with the welcome policy, by <coughs> publishing it in a subscription journal, but making your accepted manuscript available in public central. Yeah, I think still. I mean, part of the reason, obviously, is there's been a lot of publisher resistance to open access in both forms, both um, both publishing open access journals and um, doing green open access. Um, for green open access, there was has been this fear of subscription publishers that they would sort of undermine their subscription model, it would mean that people would unsubscribe because they would now be able to read this for free. And I believe there's very little evidence that that's actually taken place. Um, institutional repositories are not some great threat to um, traditional publishers. Now that can be to the disappointment sometimes of open access advocates because I think they would wish that it were this um, wedge that would then collapse the traditional publishing industry but I think it's been a transitional thing that you're working from the, you wouldn't design the system like this to have this mixed model. You'd design it all so it was open and freely available from the beginning, but we're not beginning from that point. We're changing the engine while the car's running, so we have to do this transition. And there's been a lot of persuasion of the traditional publishers that actually Green OA isn't a threat. You should allow people to do it. You shouldn't impose two-year um, you know, embargo periods on this. 
because it's insane and it doesn't help you. Um, there's been resistance of publishers to um, open access journals. There are all these myths going around. It's not peer reviewed. It's communist. It's <laughs> God knows what. So the, this incre- uh, there were in 2007 there were publishers. Uh, I think in the US hired um, Eric Desenhow, who's also defended like you know massive big business, and he would had this whole campaign to attack open access. There was this fake grassroots organization called Prism that got outed, and this was ridiculous stuff, but this is what publishers were doing for years and years and years, and this is what we really finally managed to shift against. Now, every big publisher has some open access office. There's you know a director of open access, open, open communication, open data, all of these things are... So we're now at a point where we can move on from that kind of struggle to actually you know win the argument, to write, okay, if you, there's this thing called OA 2020, this group of now it's something like 70 institutions around the world have signed up to this. And the aim is to flip journals worldwide from traditional subscription publishing to open access by 2020. Very ambitious. But if you look at the arguments between the librarians who are saying, yes, we should do this, no, we shouldn't, all of them agree they want open access as the goal. What they're disagreeing with is how to get there. And that's brilliant that now that's that's the argument we're having, not is it a good thing to do and all of those threats about it is how do we get there? So we've really moved moved on. So I think this leads into one of the questions that has that came through on the Twitter feed, which was, has open access become a dirty word? Now when I mentioned that before. Mark, you said you looked surprised and said no. Um, but I think what Matt's saying relates to why this has been seen as a dirty word, partly because of this idea that it is, is um, you know, not as good or not peer reviewed and so on. But there are other aspects to the idea about open access being negative. Do anybody have opinions on this? I know I do, but I would ask them. <laughs> or do you see it as a, a positive thing? I think it's either positive or neutral. So from my point of view as a, as a researcher, um, I'd like to have my salary paid, I'd like to get some money so that I can do some new experiments, and I'd like to get invited to cool conferences around the world, and I would <coughs> like people to read my work because I think it is of value and they could learn something from it. You know, I'd really like clinicians and policy makers to read my work. and. The, from my point of view, and I'm taking a little bit of a strong stance on this, but from my point of view, I don't really care. I don't really care how open access comes about. And to me, that's what I mean when I say open access is just sort of neutral. I just want to be able to do my research and have people access it. And I think that they should not have to pay, you know, either a subscription, a massive subscription of the library, or fifty dollars per reading for a PDF, which is completely bananas. For a day. Um, for a day, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so I I personally haven't I think that there are lots and lots of good connotations for open access. I think there are also quite a few people who would just be kind of like, could that just happen? Sure, yeah, fine. But I haven't personally experienced negative connotations of having people be able to access my work. So that leads into a question that, that came through earlier, which was it talks about. So what we've talked about so far is sort of the, um, the the sort of infrastructure and the sort of policies coming from above, and it's funders and governments and the the, the, the the grassroots coming underneath and people pushing for this and things happening. When we start thinking about the funders and these policies of the funders, what are the objectives of those policies? Now I, I I'm interested in this question myself because I've I've just um, been looking at the, the compliance, both the funders, Wellcome Trust and RCUK have been asking us about our compliance with these policies, what, what percentage are compliant and so on, which is just simply ticking a box. So, but we take a step back about what the objectives of the policies are. Is it simply to force faculty to make their research papers freely available, tick the box, or is it actually to nurture a new culture of sharing? And what you all seem to be indicating is that we don't care how it happens, as long as it happens in the background, I can just keep doing what I'm doing anyway. Which isn't no, the way you no. want to share. So what I, no, what I want to be able to do good and interesting science. So if you open up open access to being um, not just open access to the journal article, the final magic story with the bow around it that's available, but if you actually include 
the data that I used to go with it, the um, analysis code that I wrote to process that data, such that you can go away and not only read what I said that I did and what I thought it meant, but that you're able to go and work on that and take a step up. That, that to me is the most important uh, way in which science and, and other academic research will, will step forward. And I, there was an a editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine a few months ago that was pretty, I think it was the one that spawned um, the research Absolutely. parasites, yes. Um, and one of the things that, the, that that editorial was arguing is that original authors should always be included if anyone is going to reconsider the work. And no, I really don't think they do. I don't, I think that you as a reader, and this to me is what open access means, you as a reader should be allowed to think whatever you want and you should be able to make that story, your story available and others should be able to work on that. And so we can share, I can share right now because I can email my data to, to the panel members, not you, but the panel members, <laughs> and we can figure out what we all think is the best way of doing it and we can write our paper. But a better way forward is that I just, if I'm allowed to say something as a scientist, if I'm allowed to make some sort of statement, every single person in this room should be allowed to check on what I did. And that, that to me is what, is what open access is. The, that's what is, is the big step forward that we want to try and change. I want to, to, yeah, I want to say about the, the point of the funders funding research is not so that top name researchers can get read papers in high impact <laughs> journals. Yeah. So the funders have looked at why they're funding this research and they realize that they want to maximize the impact. And that doesn't just mean the impact factor TM. It means getting the work read, getting the work reused. And it's that building on and advancing science that's accelerated by open access publications so that there are no barriers, so that you don't have to worry about getting the right log on and whether you're at home or at university and the, then there's people around the world and working in hospitals which often don't have um, subscriptions and so the funders know that the point that they're doing the work is because they want the work to actually get used in the real world. They want other researchers to build on it and they want people beyond researchers to actually pick up the research and do something useful with it and affect how people think about things, that you widen knowledge. And you don't do that by locking it away behind uh, paywalls and then only having the few interesting tidbits get out into the press and that gives people a distorted idea of what work is. So that's why funders are doing this, is because it really matters to them that the work gets out there and gets properly reused. So I think, and, and one other example that we haven't mentioned so far, which I think is interesting, and, and when you asked the question about what's the most interesting thing that's happened in open access this year, I think one of the thing that sprung to my mind was uh, what Welcome have just done uh, in the last few months, which I, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's debatable. Uh, some people have different views about it, but I think it's really interesting. So this, they, what they've done is they've launched something called Welcome Open Research. And they're essentially underwriting um, any publication fees associated with uh, publishing in Welcome Open Research. So what Welcome Open Research is, it's, it's a journal of sorts. Um, it's built on a, a platform uh, which is the Faculty of 1000 Research platform. So it's using the F1000 Research platform. And the idea is it's, uh, it, it, it's a really easy way for Wellcome Trust funded people, only those people, to publish uh, their um, anything really that is rigorous science. Uh, so it may be negative and conclusive findings, uh, it may be contradictory work. Uh, the idea is that it becomes, it's, 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 you know, so, so it will allow much more widespread sharing of the outputs of research that's funded by Wellcome. And I think that's a, an illustration of them trying to make better use. Uh, or, or not better, try, trying to extend uh, the value of the research that they're funding by getting everyone to share the stuff that's actually rather difficult to share, uh, to publish in a traditional journal. And there's all sorts of interesting things about F1000 research which we could talk about as well. Um, so, but I think that's another example of, of, of funded doing something a bit different. 
but very much with that, that larger, longer term goal in mind. You know, investing in research, they want to make a difference. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm much more cynical than you guys. Um, <laughs> so maybe, maybe you're right about the World and Trust and, and, and what, what they want to do. Um, but so your question is basically my PhD question. Wow, okay. So I will be very brief. Um, <laughs> but, so the reason I'm doing the, the, the PhD that I'm doing about the politics of open access is my reasons for being interested in open access are about social justice and collective sharing and things. And they are not the government's reasons for supporting open access. Um, so, so folks, just on the UK for the moment, so the funders have been building up policies for a while, but in the UK, HEFKE and RCUK's policies, the two big research funders in the UK, these new policies in 2013, 2014, and that all, both came out this report, called the Finch Report, and that was written for the government. It was written to say what David Willits, the Minister for Science, wanted it to say, and so it went down a specific direction of supporting APC funded um, uh, gold open access is the prime thing. And when you look at um, David Willett's um, speeches um, and his reasons for doing things, it's all about efficiency and value for money and the UK's competitive advantage. And they want to have, it's this thing of wanting to have highly cited research to attract more money into the country but they don't care what the research is, they don't care if it actually has real impact, it's about it generating those metrics and, um, uh, yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll try and I won't rant any more longer. But, uh. <laughs> so, have they got any comments from the floor? I've got a couple of hands up there, two, three, here we go. Um, in this round, there was something addressed that I found really important as well. Uh, by the way, I'm in the last and Student here and very involved in open hardware and publishing. Um, so, I also think that the paywall of the journal is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, but it seems what most of the access discussion that focuses around. Because I think it's, it's quite ironic when you then find that a paper maybe doesn't have a paywall, but then it describes the solar cell, it doesn't say what chemicals it used, it has graphs that you can't access the actual data points, it uses some kind of uh, big data sets that are not uh, not there, and then they say, okay, you can email the person, but they usually so messy that they can't send it to you without a lot of work, and then it's not a priority anymore. So, the, and, and I, I've seen some resistance to that because it's now part of some funders' requirements that maybe they don't follow up on it. I don't think scientists take it too seriously as well so far, but at least they say you should provide these kind of information, but then I've heard from a lot of scientists that they say this is really impossible, this is so much additional work, we don't get any credit for it, other people don't do it. What can open access, grassroots or top down provide for that? So I could not agree with you more strongly. And um, when the panelists, when we arrived uh, before you all arrived, we were talking a little bit about the fact that kind of the grassroots advocacy fight has probably shifted a little bit. Um, I think it's still, I like your analogy of it being sort of just the very tip, you know, be, like having access to this story that might just be a really cool story because you have no way of accessing their actual evidence, right? And we do science, except when you publish it, you just make pictures in Photoshop and I would say, let me be clear, almost every single person who publishes a paper does their level best to do very well in making those pictures in Photoshop. So I don't think, I think, I worry exactly no part of my day about academic fraud. But I do think that the lack of incentives to actually do science properly, which would be cleaning up your data, making it so that other people can read it and access it and understand it, documenting everything, um, that to me is, I think it falls under the very broad description of open access, which means that people should be able to use what you have made, like, uh, made available. But 
it, I think it's, I think sort of in terms of like a grassroots community, it's falling under something more like open research, the label of open research, open science, open data, open source development, things like that. And actually, when I was, when I was um, answering a question earlier and I was saying that money should be held back until it's, an, until you have shown that you have actually made your, um, I was saying at the time, your publication openly available really it that needs to be extended into um an, a, something that is permanent so that if i disappear off and i get some fabulous job with google and i like never look back people can still access what i published that's the that i think is is a really important key twist on that but yeah i okay, like could not agree more so we have a second question yeah. okay <clears throat> i'm going to ask a really radical question Assuming we get to this um, world of, um, uh, of digital open access publication, so as a researcher, then what I'm going to do is pay quite a bit of money to a publisher to um, uh, to put my um, piece of research online. Why do we need publishers at all? Why don't we just, as an institution, um, our, our, our institute, why don't we just? Um, Put, put the stuff on the server anyway. Why don't we have a standard format and uh, in our own reviewing system? It will be a lot cheaper, isn't it? So, so we can. So, just for, for the microphone, we're coming back to the the, the rotting carcasses. <laughs> um, so, the question is: in the future, um, why would we need publishers at all? And maybe we need publishing platforms um, instead. So, that's an infrastructure question. And in fact, it is type, just as a, a history from a history lesson. It is in fact the, um, the subversive proposal that Stephen Harland actually started this entire conversation with many, many, many years ago. So nice, we nice. do it all anyway. Let's let's just start publishing now. We have this internet, and of course, that hasn't happened. But what do you think? Um, well, um, I think um, that there are. So if you think about publishing, but, but you break it down, and, and you break it down into its component parts, and what things are what functions are actually worth it you know what valuable functions are actually provided so presumably you start talking about the peer review process you talk, start talking about some of the quality controls and other quality control elements that publishers provide you talk about the way in which and this is uh, as I was corrected <laughs> on this yesterday but in some fields um, the publishers do quite a lot to improve the formatting of the article. It produces beautifully structured XML, which has all sorts of then downstream benefits and so on and so forth. They add value through maybe provision of uh, additional content that help to provide context or summaries and, and that kind of thing. So there's all these functions. Now, you, uh, these are sort of wrapped up within publishing companies at the moment. And I certainly, uh, I, I agree with the, with the sort of the, the, the vision that you're thinking about, which is actually maybe all these things just, just kind of become dispersed into different kinds of, and, and they're provided by different kinds of organizations. So yesterday in the context of preprints, for example, we were talking about maybe a model where you know, you submit your work, uh, you, you, you share your work as a preprint, that becomes normal behaviour. There are then editorial boards, communities that are associated with a preprint server to which you could say, I'd like to have my preprint assessed by this editorial board over here. And so they do, they do the assessment um, and so they essentially orchestrate the peer review process. You could also imagine that the, peer, the preprint platform now has produced that beautifully formatted lovely, you know, well-structured XML and all that stuff, that's already been done by the preprint service. Um, and then maybe once the article actually passes through the peer review process and gets updated on the same server um, uh, to the sort of, you know, the version of record, whatever you want to call it, uh, the published version, then additional services could be provided by other people, recommendation engines, um, you know, new sort of publishing services that are providing added value content that maybe help to digest a whole set of articles in a certain field that you find very valuable because that's your way of, after all, now we've got this massive sea of literature and content, you need to navigate that somehow. So that's where additional services, some of which might be paid for, could come in. So I, I, I you know, I, I agree. I think uh, publishing could change dramatically, but I think the, the individual value added services that publishers provide will largely still be necessary but they'll just be provided in different ways and at different times and places.
I mean, physics has been operating with archives since about, what was it, 1992? So, you, you know, even predating um, Harnad's subversive proposal. Um, and physics journals haven't gone away. So mm -hmm. the, the idea of uh, preprints and journals are compatible. Um, you now have what are called overlay journals, which mm -hmm. have been discussed um, by, by publishers with horror for the past decade at least. Um, um, and now there is, um, what's this? It's, it's, it's great analysis. analysis. Yeah, yeah. So there is there is now um, Tim Gowers, yeah. yeah. There is now one in um in mathematics which has come. So they will look at things in archive and then they will make requests and if revisions are done, those will be on archive. And so the journal platform is simply a gateway into certain articles on archive. And what you've really done there is just reinvent the journal, but simply just using archive as the main hosting platform, but with with a kind of um a, a front a front door cover page. So it's actually, in a way, it's not that radical because you're just, you've still got an editorial process, you've still got revisions, and so, whereas if you look at a journal like F1000 Research, everything's published up there immediately, and then you've got a review process that happens in public with people coming in, but there's no editor, and so there's no decision, hey, this is ready, do the authors have to revise, do they not, so it's distributed. But is that a good step or is that a... Because sometimes you might have the author's mates come in, quickly give it a couple of thumbs up, hey, it gets archived, and then <coughs> everyone else realises too late, and oh, you know, it's kind of a fate to come by then. So you have to think about what you actually want out of the, the kind of assessment process and the publication process. So do you want to just strip away everything and have everything just published online, or do you want a structured assessment process? Do you want editors? Do you want standardised formatting? So there's all sorts of aspects to publishing that if you just throw them all away, then we will rapidly reinvent them as we realise the bits that we threw away that actually were quite useful. So there are a lot of functions. I mean, I would say this having worked in journals for you know, 13 years, but there's a lot that journals do that I think people don't realise. You, you build editorial boards, you have meetings with them, you come up with policies, you um, can go to meetings like this and um, you, there's a lot that publishers do that um, it doesn't just happen by itself and you can, as I said, open journal systems, there's a lot of journals run on that but none of them are very big or not many of them are very big and it gets to a certain point that it's very difficult to scale and what do you do? You hire in some staff and hire in some editors and oh, you've invented a publisher. And so there are actually advantages to the scale that op publishers can operate on that means there's things that we can do that you can't very easily do on a shoestring, on university servers, on, you know, on the side with one of your research assistants acting as the um, administrative assistant. It, beyond that, and it's very difficult to scale. So I think if we do, if we just banned publishers now, then scientists would find a way to reinvent them. Yeah, I, I was going to just jump in and say I think it links back to your point about the fact that we already have all of these publishers and we might as well co-opt them and use them for the way in which we want to publish rather than reinventing publishing, which I think is I think is a really good point. Um, <coughs> from my point of view, I also wanted to just sort of throw out, although I know it's not the topic of the discussion today, that peer review is flawed. There's lots of problems, particularly with closed peer review, the way we do it right now. But I do think we do still need something like peer review, peer review mark two, or whatever it ends up being. I think that's the other reason to not just write blog posts. Because we could, you know, we could do that, but there is something very beneficial about having curated experts. Um, and the, the curation is hard and we'll, we'll leave it. But I, I think um, I've certainly had some of my papers be improved by comments that I've received from, um, re from anonymous reviewers in most cases. And I, I think I've also improved articles that I've peer reviewed. So I think I don't really want to totally get rid of peer review, even though there's lots of problems with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not trying to stand too strongly on peer review. All right, and is it good? Andrew? Oh, uh, actually, a kind of question I wanted to ask is it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of already been, <coughs> been, uh, been asked, but I'll, I'll, try and, I'll try and phrase another one, which is so I work for a traditional academic publisher, and uh, 
I wondered, um, uh, you know, a lot of what we were talking about with open access is how <coughs> the awareness movement over the years and how it's, uh, you know, there have been, uh, from an advocate's point of view, <coughs> there's been uh, a very bad practices, <coughs> from an author's point of view, there might have been very bad practices within the, within the academic publishing industry, and open access has been trying to, you know, sort of addressing perhaps some of that. Um, 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 uh, I guess my question is, what do you see, do you see traditional academic publishers as having a role in open access future? Um, um, a publisher would like CUP, for example, would argue that we are providing some of the, um, the services that Mark was talking about, perhaps you could say not as effectively or as efficiently as, as some others, uh, some other kind of uh, new, new open access publishers, but uh, um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to sort of transition from, from one model to another. So I wondered what the panel thought about the role of the role of academic <coughs> publishers in, in, in sort of an open access future. <coughs> so it's just for the microphone, because you might not be able to hear that. We're, we're talking again really about infrastructure, aren't we? Because traditional publishers have got a traditional infrastructure and then open access publishers who start fresh, of course, have the joy of being able to make it however they need it to be. But so the, the, the difference between those two things is quite dramatic. And so the question then is, if you start off as a traditional <coughs> publisher, where, how do you move into this and have you got a place into the future? Um, cool. Okay. I'd just say, we uh, mentioned earlier the idea of um, flipping <coughs> the journal, so closed access journal flipping to being an open access journal. I'm more interested in the scale of uh, flipping the publishers and the uh, closed access <coughs> publisher flipping to be an open access publisher. Springer seem to be trying to do this at the moment with their um, new fund funding model with their new license, which is um, saying, well, universities were all paying their journal subscription and paying this extra bit for APCs to the same publisher. So Springer saying, okay, continue to pay us the same amount of money and we'll just make everything that you send us open. So it's a way of trying to vastly increase the amount of um, open access stuff they publish while still getting the same revenue stream, which is obviously <coughs> key to what they're doing. But There's a precedent to this. Um, the publishers called Hindal, <coughs> who I happen to work for. So <laughs> Hindawi was launched originally by um, Ahmed Hindawi, an Egyptian um, <coughs> researcher, um, and acquired some journals and expanded, but I think it was around about 2008, the entire portfolio was flipped to open access and Hindawi became, at the time, I think the third biggest open access publisher. And so you know, publishers can do this and it can be a success. Um, you know, Hindawi was growing massively mm -hmm. since then. Um, you can also flip journals by selling them to Hindawi. <laughs> <laughs> we, we bought journals from Taylor & Francis previously. Um, there's but some traditional publishers, as I think as um, Andrew was suggesting, they're quite not quite sure what how to do the transition, but they've got certain journals knocking around that aren't really going anywhere. And an open access publisher can do a lot with them, but the traditional publishers sometimes don't know what to do with them because they don't quite fit in their portfolio, they can't quite sell them to people. And an open access publisher, you've got a different market, your market is the researchers who want to publish with you. It's not the people who want to subscribe to your journal. And so there's in certain fields, the economics don't work, and, but they do work in open access. And so that could, um, you don't have to you know, sell your journals, you can work out how to do it yourself, but it, it will take having the people in the team to advocate for it, but also to work out how you, you manage that and support it. And I think traditional publishers are now moving in that direction. It's the realisation that <coughs> you can't just ignore it and lobby against it and hope it will go away. Open access is here to stay and you've got increasing tradi traditional publishers that they're not so traditional anymore. They're, they are moving towards being more open and yeah, the various bits of open science that come up on top of open access as well. So we've had a, an 11th hour question come through on Twitter and it is, we'll need to be the last one because we are, are coming towards a close, but it does flow on well from our conversation, which is should open access publishers be making a profit? Is this something we're comfortable with as academics? So that's the question. So I mean, some of you aren't academics obviously, but, <laughs> but yeah, as an yeah, sure. no, so you might want to ask. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. I think, I think um, it, seems, it seems reasonable. I think what we need, is though an, a more effective market than we currently have. So at the, at the moment, the way that subscription journals work sort of insulate the people who are 
using the services of academic publishers, i.e. the authors and the readers, they are insulated from the people who are then paying for that. And so their decisions about where to publish aren't really influenced by the costs associated with a particular publisher. And that's one of the reasons it's often cited as why this market is, is, is rather dysfunctional. It's also dysfunctional because um, you know, there's a, every publisher in the subscription world is essentially a mini monopoly, or in some cases a rather large monopoly, um, on that content. And therefore, you know, if you want access to that content, there's only one way to get it. So, um, so however, in an open access world, publication fees you can envisage, now I'm paying for services, now I can choose. Should I publish in this journal or that journal as an author? So now maybe maybe the, the, the costs associated with the journal will begin to influence my decision. Uh, the evidence at the moment, because of the way it's being paid for, is actually it's not, because it's being centrally funded, so that's a problem. Um, however, in principle, I don't see any reason why a publisher like Hindawi or, or Biomed Central shouldn't make a profit. And actually, it's worth mentioning Biomed Central because that's another really important aspect to this transition that we're working through is the, the, entre the entrepreneurial aspect. It's a kind of grassroots in a way because it's people coming into this market, seeing an opportunity without a business model, actually. Vitek didn't have a business model. Uh, he, just, he just saw an opportunity to just make it work better. This was back in you know, the two, year 2000, roughly. And he just launched Biomed Central because he thought we have the internet. All of science can be made publicly available. That's brilliant. And so he did it, and, and ultimately he made his money by selling BMC to Springer. Um, uh, and you know, we can debate the pros and cons of that. But, um, 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 but he did a great thing. You know, he was one of the people that proved that OA publishing could actually work and be sustainable, and that's what's helped us to get further. So no, I don't oppose the idea of you know, covering your costs and making a bit of surplus. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, finish up. Go on then. No, it's, as a, again, I think this uh, any answer to this is kind of a reflection of your individual um, politics. And as a radical socialist, <laughs> I, I, I believe that the intrusion of, uh, of capital in the system is um, a wholly negative thing. <laughs> so, I, so I was going to I was going to say just to sort of arbitrate between these two points of view <laughs> that for me what I would want is more transparency. Yeah. So I don't really care that much about whether journals make a profit or not. Mm -hmm. If I have a particularly good experience and that's because they're paying their staff well and it's you know it's it's a really well done um, kind of publishing experience, then to me that's okay. But I think. <laughs> The lack of transparency and having no knowledge of how much anyone's charging, that, that means that each individual person can't even make an informed choice, and I think that's probably, so just, just transparency, that would be the, the first step, the first step, aim for that. So um, the, the, I, I'll, I'll start wrapping up and I'll, I'll answer the question, one of the questions that's come through on Twitter, which is why has a discussion about open access become a discussion about publishers? And I, I think the answer to that comes back to what we have been talking about all the way through, which is infrastructure. That, that, that for any, that the entire sharing of research, no matter how you do it, requires some sort of infrastructure. And at the moment, that infrastructure is held primarily by publishers. That might not be the case in the future, but at the moment, that, that's certainly where we're at. Um, so I think that to, to try and sort of summarise the conversations that we've had here, we, if we think about the, the grassroots and top-down, we've sort of talked about the grassroots starting this process off and the necessity to then, for, them, for there to be a top-down kind of uptake of it to make it sort of happen more broadly and that that, in fact, is a successful thing. We've also talked about... The, the goals of the policies being different, that, that what you were saying, Stuart, about that the, the government just wants to tick boxes and look good and make more money and be efficient, saving and so on and so forth, and that people who support and have been floating around in this space like me forever um, uh, really just want to see research more available, want to see better research happening. The fact that they come from different places doesn't matter if we end up in the same place. So while it would be lovely if the government was saying we're doing this for the good of the world and all of those sorts of things, who cares if the end result actually is that we get research open access? So I think, does that, is that a fair ass assessment of what we've been talking about today, do you think? Not unreasonable. Yeah. A couple of yeah. rounds. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think our answer to our question, is it grassroots or top down, it's both. It's both. And that's okay. Yeah. All right. And we're bang on the half hour. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, 
I think there might still be to coffee and tea. Is that afterwards? So please do stay for coffee and tea and a quick chat at the other side. Thanks very much.